Hello, 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 hello. It's good to see you. Say hello. Welcome to the Huskies Hockey Podcast. Well, we sitting with Andrew for another week post Christmas, waking up from your post Christmas coma. Uh, you know, fire pay, fireplace, stockings hung. You had your nice, uh, I left out a nice old fashioned uh, for Santa that, that uh, uh, it was gone. So he came and visited our house. Um, you know what? Actually, I just realized I did not make it old fashioned. I, my wife and I actually, um, I made her a whiskey sour and I actually had a daiquiri, uh, was our drink of choice on Christmas Eve tonight. So that's, you know, you could make up for that with, but making yeah. it an old fashioned. Hey, you know, I huge, huge fan of old fashions. Um, really whiskey bourbon anything like that in general brandy uh uh yep brandy like brandy as I well mean, like exclusively uh, brandy old-fashioned not exclusively but i've really grown to love brandy in the last couple of years so the majority hmm. of my old fashions are brandy now but oh nice and well, Usually, the last couple of days it's been brandy nogs you know ah uh, for the season dash mm-hmm. and nutmeg on top uh those those go down nice and easy but uh, but you can't go wrong with the old fashioned, no matter what brown liquor you're using. Yeah, that's true. And but yeah, this time uh, I went with a daiquiri, and I'm not normally, uh, you know, because I got my bar set up downstairs, and I've got you know a bunch of assorted brown liquors, um, and then I've got like a bottle of bottle of rum. I've got Diplomatico rum. I have you know Sapphire for my gin. Uh, I think I just have like smearing off or something for vodka because i'm not that big of a vodka Kharkov. drinker yeah yeah <laughs> car, the car crash you got a, you got a plastic jug <laughs> vodka that's, that's yeah, your house the, vodka the, the, the what tonka to... taka so um you know anything that is 10 bucks in a 175 with a handle on it you know you know that's trouble or it's it's the uh the way that you name a cheap plastic jug vodka it's like you have like an algorithm it's just a, a color and a animal <laughs> So purple hawk ah. vodka, blue wolf <laughs> vodka, yellow giraffe vodka. It's, it's like Mad Libs at that point. Yes, it's just like, what exactly should we name our next? Uh, yeah, yeah. Purple flamingo vodka. I like right. it. So, but I haven't had, a, like, I've never made a daiquiri before and I don't order daiquiris, anything like that. So I just decided, you know, I've got simple syrup, lime, you know, why not try it out? It was really good. Highly recommend so daiquiris. Is, I mean, I guess the, I, I'm thinking there is like a, it's like margaritas where there's a official by the book recipe, but they've been mm. bastardized over the years through like the blender yeah. and bunch of ice drinks. I'm sure you, so you didn't Pretty make much. that. Yep. You made the, what's, yep. what's the real recipe? It's rum and what lime juice, rum, lime juice, and simple syrup. That's it. That's it. It's a daiquiri. Shake, yep. Over over ice or nope. just uh, up on just, a, like a little coupe yep. glass. Up, okay. Yep. Which is which is what my uh, wife got me for Christmas was uh, two glasses. She said it was you know you know for for me, but obviously I will continue making her whiskey sours uh, because she that's the one real brown liquor she likes to drink. Uh, she's not a fan of it. Well, how do you, sh- how do you make, would you want to swap whiskey sour recipes? I haven't made one of those in a while, but do you use the egg white, which is yes. my favorite ingredient for yep. that? Yeah. Which the first one I had, you actually made for me. Really? When, um, <laughs> yeah. In the, uh, I, I believe that was the podcast that uh, is down in infamy uh, where we got absolute, that was whiskey. whiskey Dave's, Dave. uh, yes, yes. Podcast where he brought a bunch of whiskeys for us to try. Oh, and, and try, try, we did. <laughs> well, well, I, bl- I blame Whiskey Dave on that because, I, I, like, we thought we were going to try them, but then he kept pouring like the same vial. Like, I don't know. He he was very, um, uh, I would say, generous with with, with his uh, his his vials that he gave us. So 
thank you for that. But yes, um, yeah. So it comes with the egg white and everything, nice. and get. I try to get the froth on it, but uh, but uh, Teresa likes it, so that's um, you know always a plus. You know, I'm not going to give her an old fashioned. I think that's uh, it's a little too, a little too much, a little too bracing so. for her. Yeah, a little, a little too. <laughs> I don't, what is it? What's it called? Spirit forward, I think, is what it's called. It's so, so I, I can mask the bourbon and brown liquor flavor a little bit more with a whiskey sour. It is a good choice. Yeah, it's very good. So, um, anyway, ha- yeah. Well, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever you uh, parlance you want to go with. Um, every. You know, overall, I had a I had a good holiday. Um, you know, was uh, hosted on Christmas Eve uh, with uh, with the in laws, uh, my wife's family, and then uh, went up to my family in in Sox Center. Uh, Dad and I uh, talked about what we're going to do here with the uh, with the frozen face off and mm-hmm. what our plans are going to be next. Uh, we'll obviously touch on that in the the last uh, in the later half of the show. Um, but oh, yeah, o- over. Yeah, call we'll, that, we call we'll, that a teaser. We'll call that a teaser in the biz, which is what we call the business in the biz. Um, now, how about uh, how about for you? How was your holiday? It was good. I didn't do a whole lot of anything. My, the my employer gave us last Friday off, and then Monday and Tuesday, so I had five Ooh. days off. And I so I went back to work today. I think five days like. Yeah, that was plenty. Like I probably could have gone over with with four. I'm not going to complain being paid to not work, but sure, it was almost a little too much. So watched yeah. a lot of movies. I mean, there wasn't much, not a lot of hockey to say to talk about. So mm-hmm. caught up on some of my early '70s films and uh, did some exercise and reading and just kind of relaxed. And I enjoyed how it. how are the how were the films of the early '70s? Are they all wonderful? Uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> I can still find, um, something of merit even in the worst films. Uh, so, so, so recap, what, what, like, are you just, uh, like the top X amount of movies from a certain year or are you just randomly throwing darts to see what strikes your fancy? Or yeah. So I, I kind of look at what I have access to first. So I have Amazon prime. And this service called Canopy that you can get through libraries. And so Mm. each of those have a good stockpile of old films. And there's a website I go to that you can look at it through the year. So that sort of gives me some first ideas. Then I'll go to the top box office films. I want to at least get like the top 20 box office movies. And then I'll go to the Oscars. I'll see everything that's been nominated. Pick off the ones that I haven't seen there. There's a lot on YouTube. I'll say, get, like randomly search something. If that was on YouTube, a lot of a lot of times the movies are so old that mm. there's on YouTube for free, which is nice. Sure. And yeah, there's uh, you know some gray market websites that I go to as well <laughs> uh, that uh, supply me some of these uh, some of these harder to find films. So, uh, and I don't really have a rhyme or reason to it. I just kind of what strikes my fancy, and you know, some of them I. To kind of bounce off me like Teflon don't really make much of an impression. Some that sort of engross me. Uh, and it's, uh, it's fun. I, I enjoy it quite a lot. So you say Oscars. So like, has there been like some really big Oscar misses you think, um, kind of off the top of your head? Um, well, like as, been... as if like surprised that they received Oscar attention. Yeah, either either that or in a good like, way or a bad way. Yeah, or or like they, I don't know how this one was overlooked or anything like like as far as like it was a box office hit, but it wasn't. It didn't get award season. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't. I'm not like a huge Oscar fan. I I use it as a a reference more than anything. I like to see what the I I see the Oscars as it's a it's the picture that the industry wants to take of itself of any given year. That doesn't Ooh. necessarily mean they're the best films. That sounds poetic. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a surprise like throughout it's, this really hasn't changed much, but like comedy for instance, isn't really 
seen as a viable genre uh, at the Oscars. So mm-hmm. there are like comedic performances that I feel are excellent that not surprisingly go unnominated in some of these years. It's interesting in the early seventies had been like the first big ru- rush of uh, foreign films being nominated at the Oscars. There was a movie called the emigrants, which was, it has an Oscar oddity where it was nominated in two separate years. Cause it was nominated. It was released in Sweden in 71 and got a best picture or excuse me, got a best foreign film nomination for that year. And then it was released in the States the year after and it got a best picture nomination, which is really, oh. really unusual for foreign films that of that time period. But there was a couple of others, uh, there was another Best Picture nom- nomination, a Swedish film called Cries and Whispers in this time. Um, and some some of the Best Actor, Best Actress, a lot of screenplay nom- nominations. Like every year, there's at least one foreign film nominated in those categories. Best Director as well as Fellini's nominated a few times, uh, Bergman as well. So this was kind of a peak uh, of international films being uh, getting some Oscar love. And generally, those are pretty solid picks i haven't been disappointed by by too many of those uh so yeah it just depends on you see what the what the industry is like like westerns are still huge in this time period whereas you know, a couple years ago when i was watching 80s films westerns were basically dead then so it's kind of nice that hmm. here there's a there's a lot of westerns and some pretty darn good ones too and so you, you get to see the trends you get to see the cultural touchstones that they're that are inspiring the films and the content of the movies it's um it's fun i like kind of going through every all kinds of genres so i'm watching musicals what? i'm watching comedies and dramas war films all kinds of different types of movies sure. that's i like that what year what year did shame come out that had to that was like in the 50s wasn't it i always thought of shame as, i think it's like 50 early 50s i'm gonna say i thought i always thought of shame as like the unofficial like death of the western uh, like that's kind of but maybe oh, i'm wrong on that aspect through the 70s they were i would say more even prevalent. more even more prevalent than horror films there was a film called heaven's gate that was released in 1980 which is a famous bomb that not only killed westerns for pretty much the whole decade of the of the 80s but it killed a studio as well it's like one of the more notorious hollywood uh, oh, bombs right. and so that that's the movie that is largely credited for killing westerns there was mm-hmm. a couple uh also in that time period that didn't work but certainly like the like b westerns those are replaced by b horror films so like the the crank them out we can do we can do these in our sleep that became the horror sure. film in there in, like slashers in particular in the early 80s and then westerns were largely forgotten until like unforgiven early 90s and then there was a brief resurgence. They're still sort of more niche than anything. Back in like this early seventies, you can count on, you know, several dozen per year being being produced. Mm, so mm, fair enough. Seventy two was that Godfather then? It was. I, I, I want to rewatch one. that one. I, it's probably been ten years since I've seen it. It's seen, I've seen it a couple of times, but it's always good to go back to that one because I do like the Godfather. I uh, I. Uh tried to watch it like five years ago and i fell asleep really like i was like this is so boring and this, like to me it's just really? so incredibly overrated um and i know like my wife is probably yelling at the pod right now just like how she like it's one of her favorite films maybe that's a little harsh she'll correct me on that and we'll have a but she'll she definitely really really likes it and I'm, I like it. I'm just like, I can't understand what he's saying. Like I need subtitles on it's. Oh I, yeah. I, I slow, pretty much watch plotting. subtitles for anything. Yeah. Especially with Brando in that era. Um, yeah. it's, it's mush mouth. He's got the cotton balls in the jowls. So you, you've got to just uh, lead along. And maybe it's because I'm, I'm, I'm such like in a, in a Dick Tracy type of like mindset. I just look at him at like a Dick Tracy villain where he's just, I don't know. It doesn't really scare me. He just sounds like a mush mouth, like a uh, caricature villain. Like, I don't know. So I don't know. I know I'm in the minority. Send all your hate mails to Andrew's email. Cause I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to, I want to read it. See, I, I'm one of those people that defend the original Godfather over part two. I feel like people say, well, part two is the best. Uh, I, I prefer the original, but uh, 
send me that hate mail. Uh, I know Dan Jacobson, oh, okay. J- DJ, he's probably one of these <laughs> uh, part two stands. So no, he's he, he's the part three stand. Actually. He's, <laughs> he's the only one. He's he's the one. <laughs> so he would be a part yeah. three stand. <laughs> So anyway, we got Aki to talk about. I mean, kind of. Um, we got Bemidji on the docket. Uh, leaders of the CCHA halfway through the season, the unofficial halfway mark. Um, I surprised me uh, that they are where they are, but also really surprised me as how bad the CCHA is. Um, so we can always kind of take that, uh, you know, maybe with a little bit of a, a grain of the salt around the rim of a margarita. And it's a, it's a really like for an innocuous non-conference, I think it's a really pivotal weekend for the Huskies. Um, minus a head coach, um, he is out, uh, right now uh coaching the world juniors as the um assistant coach so shyak behind the bench um and it's a it's pivotal in a sense that we have a really bad non-conference record and um you know we're already kind of in a hole and when it comes to the ccha with our performance against minnesota state earlier this year and um you know, this is kind of a weekend where we need to get, you know, a losses are going to hurt us in the pairwise um, quite a bit. So we, we, you know, we're already kind of on that bubble, but if we, if, if we drop some of these games here, we're, we're looking at a, a situation where we have to make a really deep run um, in the frozen face off to get a chance. Yeah, slight correction. You done messed up, A.A. Hey, Ron! Uh, they are second place if you look at winning percentage in the CCHA. Michigan Tech uh, is actually in front because they've only played 10 games, whereas Bemidji's played 12. So if you want to look at it through winning percentage terms, then Tech would be on top. But uh, your main point there is that the CCHA ain't very good. That certainly rings true. Uh, and doesn't need to be corrected. Yeah, so Bemidji stayed at 37th in pairwise right now. Um, yeah. Got a home and home, so you got the game at Bemidji on Friday, and then they got the, uh, smartly, I think, the uh, the day between for travel and return to St. Cloud to play on Sunday. Weird, the the last three years that they've had this, this uh, scheduling, they've all been home and homes, but Bemidji's gotten the first game in all three of those years. Usually they like to rotate that like the St. Thomas uh, series in in that same time period, they've flip flopped between who's got the first, who's at home, the first game and who's on the road. Bemidji is just a stickler. We want to start this series in Bemidji, I suppose. So, uh, but I kind of like that. I, I like that they're coming back here after the first break in Bemidji uh, rather than, because I think they're going to win. I think St. Cloud's going to win their home game. But the the road game will be the tougher test, I think. And I think for them to be focused and um, itching to get back on the ice over the last you know three week break or, or so, I think starting yeah. on the road, I think is a good idea for them. So, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be it's not ideal for, for them to lose a game here in the series. I mean, I don't think it's going to kill your season, but, you know, uh, you, you'll lose the game up in Bemidji. I, I, you know, I, you still got room. You still got a, a decent enough schedule and, and opportunities to make up that that loss uh, in the coming, you know, last two plus months of the regular season. But that would just make that that task that much more difficult. So, yeah, a sweep here would be really nice. Uh, and Benji's, as we've said, you know, they're at the top of a bad conference. Um, depending on which way you want to look at the standings point wise or point percentage wise, they're, they're near the top at least, or if not the top. And so, I mean, it's not going to be an easy uh, series uh, playing Bemidji is never really an easy task. It's never really a fun task, but uh, uh, there was a lot to, lo- there's a lot to play here, uh, play for here. And you want to get the second half started on the right foot. I'm feeling good about the series. I, I don't know if, if you're like, hey, can't lose one here. If that's uh, evidencing some trepidation or 
you a little worried about these uh, beavers or what, what, what's your, what's your take coming in? Yeah. This I, I am a little bit worried and I, really? I don't know if it's necessarily about the beavers in general, but just, I don't know. I just feel like for this game and I, I usually hate this term, um, but I might throw it out there anywhere um, where it just kind of feels like maybe a trap game. Um, it's, it, I, I think it's, it, it's one on paper. We should, um, you know, be able to, to take care of, um, you know, we've had, but I don't know. I, I, I just, there's just something back about me that is maybe a little bit worried about this series a little bit more uh, this time. So I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I, I, but maybe it's, um, you know, hopefully it's unfounded. Um, you know, looks like everybody is healthy. At least Reiners is back practicing uh, with the team now. So that's, um, that's a good sign. Um you know, I think, but, you know, hopefully this is kind of a series where the, we can go ahead and jumpstart, um, you know, it's like Okabe and whatnot, you know, maybe like get him out of the funk that he's been in and, you know, we're able to go ahead and, and, and get, get him some confidence. Um, but you know, they've got, um, they've got, they got a couple of good, you know, solid goal, goal scorers um, there. They are missing kind of a key defenseman who is also at the World Juniors with pole camp. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, you know, they came out, they took care of business. Bemidji took care of business last weekend, um, you know, obviously against uh, a very, um, a very poor Bad. Bowling Green team. Um, so, but, you know, having them get, you know, a little bit of, um, I guess that was a couple of weeks ago, so maybe that's not the two case, weeks, yeah. but yeah. So I don't know. It's just, um, it just has me a little bit worried and they kind of play the type of game where it could be a little bit of a, a lockdown type, you know, uh, situation. They were able to, you know, take North Dakota to overtime. So that's a solid, you know, they split against Mankato, which we didn't really do that well against. I don't know. It's just something with this and the time off and not having our head coach. And and it just makes me kind of nervous. And maybe I'm just kind of thinking about all the other times we've had these types of games when our head coach was gone, where I felt like, you know, we've had kind of lackluster efforts against teams that we should win. Um, because I I I feel like I remember that happening with Bot uh, with Motsko when he was coaching World Juniors as well, but I'd have to double check that. Can't remember if if it was, when it was two years ago if Larson. How many times? When when was Larson at the World Juniors? Because I know the twenty twenty two he had the Olympics that year. But was he also, I feel like he was also at the uh, World Juniors that same year. Because I, I thought that when they did the Bemidji series that year, which was right around the same time, I thought that he was gone for that series as well. But maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's never great to have your head coach missing. Did you Were you able to fact check that? Um. Yeah, it was uh, the 1920. Okay, so he was. That's just that's the only other time he's been on the junior staff. Correct, at least in his time in Saint Cloud. Okay, so I don't know what. Maybe there's maybe they had a player that was missing during that. um, Oh yeah, Peart. Peart would have been missing for the last two before this. Maybe that's what I was thinking. But Mm -hmm. um, we're able to sweep them that year. That would have been 2021, and then last year. They played them early in the season, and that was the first loss of the year for the Huskies uh, when they lost the game at Bemidji, and that was yep. a big disappointment kind of game. We weren't expecting them to to play as poorly as they as they did that first game. Then they came back and beat them on the next game at home. That was the game where the Adam Ingram uh, Herbie finalist goal of the year um, was in that that home Bemidji game last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now playing them again in this uh, Christmas break 
stretch of the schedule. Uh, and said this at the beginning of the year when the schedule was released. Weird that they're playing this weekend. You've had two or three weeks off, and then you have a week off after this series. Um, so it's just you can't really get into a great rhythm. I almost wish that they would have put an exhibition game on it next weekend for just to keep the rhythm going because it's weird to have to ramp up for this series and then sort of hit another bye week until you really hit the the ground running on the second half of the NCAA schedule at Denver on the 12th. But uh, you can only play with the schedule that's in front of you, I suppose. Yeah, so this Bemidji team, as you mentioned, you know, we're kind of used to them playing some you know, stifling, trappy kind of play. I think they've got away from that a little bit in years, in in recent years. Not to say that they're uh, an offensive juggernaut, but you look at some of their results this year, 6-4 to four win against Michigan Tech, where they were down 4 nothing in that game. A uh, 7-6 to six win at Mankato, which was, you know, they had to come back from, I think, three goals down in that one. You know, beating Lake Superior 7-1. to one. Uh you know, they also lost to Lake State six to one. So, I mean, that <laughs> was in the same weekend. So you get the highs and you get the lows, mm. the uh, mm. Tom Seritori experience. But uh, yeah, that top score for them, Leighton Road. Uh, get used to that last name. Uh, his brother, Nolan, <laughs> is uh, in the pipeline for the Huskies uh, at uh, White Bear Lake. Or played a little bit at uh, at juniors this year, too. I believe he's still at White Bear. He's 18, so I think he's he's finishing up his senior year. So maybe not next year, but perhaps the year after gets like a full year of juniors under his belt. Seems like a pretty good prospect. And uh, Leighton seems to be Bemidji's best scorer. Uh, they've also got a defenseman, Kyle Luft, tied for the team lead in points with 18 with Rhodes. So that's two point per game players for them. Uh, again, some of these games are against a lot of the games are against CCHA uh, competition. So not the best uh, um uh, a competition that they've been playing, but still they've got some, got some guys who can, who can score. Uh, yeah, I think it is a bit of a break that they're missing pole camp. Like if, if it's between Bemidji missing one of its better more skilled players and the Huskies losing their coach, I, I might, I might say I, I'd rather have yeah, the coach not there than, than a, a good player. But, uh, and so we'll see. I, I mean, Shyax, this is where he gets paid here, you know, uh, stepping up into the to the head coaching position here uh, in an interim basis. I'm sure, Brett's going to be calling him uh, after those games in Sweden, and uh, he's going to be nitpicking, <laughs> checking yep, in. Yep, exactly, he's going to be he's watching on Flow Sports. Um, yeah, Nolan, um, Nolan Road, uh, like you said, White Bear Lake. He actually played the first part of the season at uh in the ushl right and then uh, but he's back Trump. now with his, his but, high school team but he's back so i mean you know we can go into the debate what's best for development and whatnot and and things along those lines but you know to see a player you know ushl you know have 13 points in 16 games and then go back to high school it's like that's like not even fair <laughs> I mean, I know, I know White Bear Lake are like perennial chokers anyway, but, um, so, so they'll find a way to like fumble it. And, and, but at the same time, I mean, <laughs> Nolan has 14 goals in nine games so far, 19 points in nine games, um, you know, for White, White Bear. So, I mean, he's, and he'll probably yeah. go back to juniors after the high school season's done after they choke. Um, <laughs> he'll probably return to the USHL and then, you know, probably play a full year of USHL next year. Uh, seems to be the plan. It's kind of nobody... like what, uh, what's, what's his name from Andover Thorson. That's what he did last year. He kind of straddled yep. his high school season with USHL stints. So mm-hmm. it seems to be something that's kind of so. normal nowadays. Yep. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to pick a side on best for development. And I know, like, USHL, um, I know, like, high school, Minnesota high school hockey, and I know they have their uh, their thoughts and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera. We're not, I'm not going to go into any of that. But um, what I will say um, is that it's, you know, having a prospect like that, you know, obviously I'm, I'm really excited about, and I'm happy that you brought that up, and I didn't you know, make the connection uh, that they were brothers, which I definitely should have with the last name and how it's spelled. So 
Thank you for that. I think it's, um, I think it's pronounced road. It might be read for all I, for all I know, but I, I believe it's road. That's what I'm going with at yeah. least. Well, well, uh, Alex will uh, double check that for us. I think there, that's uh, right. He'll, yep. So, um, I went back, um, to Bob's years, um, uh, when he was at world juniors and why I'm a little bit, you know, I guess, you know, messed up when it comes to it. Um, the, uh, like the desert hockey classic, um, was in the 2016, 2017 season. And the first game we lost to UConn. UConn. Yeah, there you go. Good Tage job. Thompson was on that team. I remember watching that yep. game. They struggled to beat uh, ASU the next game. That was the year. The other mm-hmm. game, it would have been Brown, your favorite team, you Brown. Go. I think Brown. it was a nine to eight game in the first in that first round game with them and uh, ASU. If you can, what? If you can look How that many? up, they've scored nine times. Nine. nine. Nine times. Nine times. In that game. So. And only one by one. So, uh, yeah, I remember that. That one was up. I'm actually oh. going to the Desert Hockey Classic uh, next week. Ooh. That one that one was up in Prescott, Arizona, which is like that was, up, yep. up in like the Flagstaff, northern Arizona area. Now it's obviously on the on the mullet on the ASU campus. But uh, that one, I think, was the only time they had it up there, which was weird. But, yeah, that was certainly a weekend that they were – not they were out of sorts uh and certainly probably could have uh could have used their coach uh, uh on that <laughs> on that weekend yeah so you said nine uh yeah it was eight to eight um and then yeah it must have been uh a shootout or something along those lines as to why they does were it able say, to advance does it say eight to eight final it says it must, it must have been a, a shootout just for whoever advanced to the title yeah. game. And I think Brown won it. Like St. Cloud was in these tournaments. I think there was that one in Robert Morris, maybe in Larson's first year, that Brown won that one too. That was the year that St. Cloud got kicked, got their ass kicked by Union randomly. Yeah. I think Brown won that tournament too. It's just like Brown has these random, like, we're going to play really good in a random holiday tournament and then not play well at all for the remainder <laughs> of the year. And well, Cloud's that's what been, that one uh, us show voter keeps saying in their head on is like God, that mid holiday tournament. They've they, got that uh, that cup got that. from the uh, from the from the Desert Hockey Classic, and they're like, "See, this is <laughs> See? this is the future." There you go. Um, and then the next year when Moscow went, uh, it was a series against Princeton, uh, where oh, sure, uh, where it was two yeah, that ties. was not good either. Yeah, yeah. So I remembered what, like, I remembered that I was scorned, but I couldn't remember why. And now it's like, oh, yes, that's right. And because... if we're talking about Larson's Olympic uh, tenure, which I think it wasn't just one. Yeah, that was like a couple of weeks. I remember the first weekend, I think, that he was gone. They got swept at Denver. Huskies did. That was the, one of the games they had a 3 nothing lead that they coughed up. So mm-hmm. they got swept in that series. I think that have also been the uh, those two Tuesday games they played with Duluth because of COVID rescheduling. I think Shayek would have been behind the bench for both of those too. And those might have been ties and like overtime or shootout results. Yeah, like now that you're saying it, I check the uh, 1920. Like when would they? Would that have been the Marichi Classic? That Okabe had four goals against Mankato. Yes. That was World Juniors, so that he wouldn't have been there for that. So that would have been like, as we're just recounting it off the fly here, been like the only time they've won a regulation game without their coach. Well, when their head coach is out at the at the World Juniors. Hey, and Okabe scored his first of the year that weekend against Mankato. Um, that was his first goal. Like, so he scored four goals in that game, but those were yeah. his first four goals. Exactly, would have been his first four goals of his career then. Yep. So maybe, yeah, maybe uh, Larson's departure will will spark Okabe. Again. Well, we'll we'll spark Okabe. Here we go. Well, now I'm now I'm optimistic again. So everything kind of comes back around. Yeah. So another thing for Bemidji too, uh, looking at their goaltending situations. You know, another thing that we think about Bemidji. At least they're going to have a tough goalie. Eh, not so much this year. I mean, uh-uh. Matias Matias Scholl has been back. He, he was 
played the Bowling Green games, both wins for them two weeks ago. And that was his first action since uh, October. There was an injury there that knocked him out. And that forced them to play this Gavin Enright, who the Huskies have seen at least last year. He played decent against the Huskies, but he was pretty terrible. Put up an 862 save percentage uh, as the main starter, really the every game starter for them after Scholl got hurt in late October. That's got to be one of the worst save percentages in, in all of college hockey. And so I would expect to see Scholl in the net at least on Friday, if not both nights, just based on Enright's struggles this year. So, yeah, maybe catching a bit of a bad break there that you're catching uh, them uh, with their better goalie healthy now. But uh, but keep an eye out for that, too. And from what we were gathering in the Omaha, the last Omaha game that Posh played, that perhaps there was a bit of an injury concern with, uh, with Bassey. But according to your reports, that – with Reiner is looking like he's he's going to be back here that the whole team knock on wood was healthy so I would assume that includes mm-hmm. Bassey and with the with the game in between the day off in between I would expect him to be able to play both of these games uh yeah I'd sort of be surprised if he doesn't so uh yeah now interesting to see what shakes out uh, in the battle of the goaltenders this weekend but yeah, it's not going to be easy, as I said. Uh, you got to take Bemidji seriously, but I think this is a team you have the skill advantage on and played a lot of the same opponents this year. And so uh, lots of common opponents between these two these two teams. Yep. And uh, which is, as you said, with the Husky struggle in non-conference, you really can't afford. You're, you're, you're already needing to play catch-up because of the, what, 2-5-1 and one mark? Some of those with you know overtime losses mixed in there, you're still kind of needing to play catch up because of the hole you dug there. You don't want to further that digging of the hole by taking any less than two regulation wins this weekend. So that's what I'm hoping for. Um, two two full W's. Uh, let's hope to see it. Yep, exactly. Um... And just kind of as a reminder, uh, check your local listings um, for the for the time because the time did change for the Sunday game. Uh, the Sunday game is at four o'clock, and I know CHN still has it listed at six o'clock. Your tickets probably still have it listed at six o'clock, but it's uh, it's uh, four, 4 p.m. Start. Central four, okay. 4 p.m. Central for the for the Sunday game. That means it's three o'clock my time. That's thank you for that because I I probably would have taken. CHN's word for it. What does it say for the Friday game? Is that still seven central? Yeah. And that, I think we they think basically, that that's, that's correct. Yes. Um, I, I think, I think SCSU wanted to change it um, because of the new year's and the festivities for it being new year's Eve, you know, a game early. Plus you got um, the day off before. It's not like you're playing, you know, a, a quick exactly. turnaround the next game. So yeah, probably a smart idea. So, so, um, which kind of a bummer, um, for my idea, which is, um, having it, uh, played at, you know, 10 o'clock, um, and then having like an overnight type game. So then like, instead of like 50 more minutes till the liquor store closes, you can have a, a, a cheer like that, but for, you know, till 2023 closes or something like that. Um, they didn't, uh, they didn't take my offer though. So yeah, we need to get some of this more creative scheduling. Um, you know, we, we yeah. talked about the, the black Friday weekend. You know, I hadn't scheduled a game there in years. Maybe they need to do like the midnight mass I, type of uh, scheduling here. Try it out. Like think of, uh, just think of the booze sales, uh, new year's at the herb, like watching a hockey game. I don't know what could be better. Right? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Why, why, why be 10 o'clock? Just do it at midnight started at midnight it started at midnight oh no i gotta get to bed i don't know about that <laughs> no you gotta yeah, don't they should start yeah, a game a start a game and at 2 a.m on the day that daylight savings time is then everybody <laughs> would be confused well what does that mean is it one o'clock one a.m or two a.m right? and no one would know that that would be the best idea it would be like uh, going back in time when you have to try to write down the time of uh, of uh, when goals were scored, and you have to 
that would have actually have to be like the the minute hour and minute of the clock you could you could have somebody score like make it two to one and then all of a sudden the equalizer to make it two to two was scored on paper like 45 minutes earlier or something yeah. like that because of the time change i like so, it that feels like Chaos. jason bryant would uh have a little bit of a, a conniption if that w- that were to happen well Nietzsche says out of order comes chaos. So that's right. No, out of chaos comes order. I don't, I don't remember which one, one of those, said. one of those, two. one of those two. So, so, um, so, uh, that's the men. Women are off, um, for a while. They're off until the 12th. Um, and then they do have an exhibition game. Um, probably just kind of a shake the, shake the nerves. Um, uh, you know, shake the rust off the blades type of a, a game. Um, I am going to stay on my free Del Monaco bandwagon. Um, but I don't think that that's going to happen, uh, throughout the season. So a little bit bummed, but, uh, there's always red shirt freshman year, I guess is, is, is an option. Um, but uh, I did ask McHatton um, if there's an update status for Grace Wolf, who is um, confirmed to be out for the year. So a few uh, you know, weeks ago when I said she was on crutches but putting weight on it, and so hopefully she'll be back shortly. Not going to be the case. So um, that leaves a big hole there on defense that Himmler Ulf is going to stay back there. Um, I don't think there's any kind of way around it, um, which – is kind of a bummer. I, I, I like her skills a little bit more up front, but um, you know, nothing, you know, she's been admiral on the back end, and she'll just um, have to keep doing that here as, as, as the season goes on. So did he confirm um, that for sure that Hamler Rowe was going to stay back at D for the rest of the not year? Not that, not that part. Um, that's just my guess. I mean, I would uh, probably guess that as well. I've, I put it out there. Uh, the last pod, one of the last podcasts that I prefer to bring her back up to forward. I feel like you have enough depth at defense. It's not a, it's not a position of great need. It's in terms of like, we need to shift her back to defense, but Occam's razor. I'm going to probably agree that I would expect uh Himmlerova to stay at the point for the remainder of the year. I wonder if you can get speaking of red shirts um, for your favorite player, I wonder if you can get a red shirt for Grace Wolf. I mean, she only played 11 games this year. I'm not sure what the cutoff is. Like, what did Drew LeBlanc play before he broke oh, his leg? Probably yeah. right around that 10 or 12. I think he can – I mean, she is just a junior this year, so she's got another year anyway. But mm-hmm. I think in these cases you can, like, um, apply or, you know, write a letter for good cause <laughs> uh, to see if you can get an extra year. To um, whom it may concern – please let me have another year of eligibility could work. So maybe it's a a blessing in disguise. I I don't know. It's a bit, it's a big loss because I think she was like peaking at that weekend. Like it was her, it was your pal. It was my pal. Her last weekend. And we haven't seen her since. So, so like the new Madden curse is the weldy pal. It's the pal curse. Uh, Yeah, exactly. So what can you say? Uh, Drew played 10 games. Okay. Um, so yeah, oh, kind she's of right there, of, right at 11, right around, right, right around that area. So, so we'll, we'll see if that's the route they want to go or if she's able to go that way. But, um, like I said, big, um, big kind of hole there. Cause I really liked her game and how she was progressing and, you know, the next uh, couple of weekends are really big in terms of getting points uh, for, for the Huskies. So, but we'll preview those um, when the time comes to it. So they're even, they're more off than the Huskies are. They don't even play any games. I mean, they play an exhibition game on the, on January 6th against St. Thomas. That was like a recently added game Mm -hmm. to the schedule. A good little idea, I think to get a tune up being off for more than a month in their case uh, before they, uh, get back to action against Mankato on the 12th. But even I was looking at like the, uh, I mean, we got a fair amount of tournaments on the men's side this, this weekend and next. And then also on the women's side, there's a couple of tournaments, not as many. They just don't have us looking at the le- the next two weeks of non-conference. There was like no real games of intrigue on the women's side. Like 
Quinnipiac and well, LIU is like the most marquee non-conference matchup. That's anytime you're much. talking about two teams out east, like none of them's going to be marquee. Let's face it. I well, mean, the, the week thing... and, oh, we should say so the fifth and the sixth, you got two great ECAC. I guess it's like four great teams out there because you got, you got Cornell versus uh, Clarkson, and then you got St. St. Lawrence against Colgate, and then you flip flop it the next game. Those are all the top 10 teams. So if you want to even kind of think of that as like a tournament, quasi tournament, against, you know, two games against uh, top 10 opponents. And you'll get the first Colgate Clarkson game of the year, uh, which I think is they were the two best teams in that league. So in terms of league play, that's coming up, not this weekend, but next. But other than that, like even that Duluth and Quinnipiac series, which is kind of an intriguing non-conference matchup, that wasn't until uh, the 12th and 13th that weekend. So a little bit of a wait for some for some good non-conference action on the women's side. But as you said, it's it's less uh, intriguing, uh, the non-conference matchups on the women's side. It's because of the dominance of the uh, – we just have to have a good ECAC uh, WCHA matchup for that to happen. Everything else is yeah. kind of ho-hum. Exactly. Um, but there was a little bit of a, a holiday news dump uh, that the NCHC kind of pulled out, um, and that is the – uh, end of an era uh, for the for the NCHC Frozen Faceoff has been announced. Um, we got two more years at the XL Energy Center, and then starting in the uh, in 2026, uh, it will be um, on campus sites. Um, so how the format is going to work out is nine and eight, um, with the addition obviously of Arizona State, will play each other. Uh, at the number one seed rink on Tuesday, I believe. Tuesday or Wednesday, one of those two, prior to yeah. the first weekend of the uh, right. quarterfinals. Yeah. Uh, quarterfinals uh, is going to be the same, best of three. Um, and then the next weekend, it will be at the higher seed, um, just a one-game series. Single games. Um. And then, uh, obviously, the winner of those two games will uh, face off at, again, the higher seed. Um, so, as, you know, everything that kind of goes into the Frozen Faceoff postseason tournament and neutral sites, um, we were the last of the West, um, and the last of the West has fallen when it comes to it. Kind of when you heard the news, kind of what was your reaction? A little bit surprising, but not not terribly, not shocked or anything like that. Um, I, I thought that last year's tournament, you know, with the especially the the championship game there, uh, drawing such a low crowd, and yeah, North Dakota looks pretty decent this year. But we've seen in past North Dakota is no longer a lock to make it every year. There's been some, some tournaments that they haven't made. And, depending on their fan base isn't as uh, automatic maybe as it was at, certainly in the WCHA final five days, um, but also in the, in the NCHC era as well. And it's just, um, it seems less and less. It's, it's all, it's, it seems like more and more an old fashioned idea to keep this thing going at, at the X or any sort of neutral site for, for this conference. It is a shame. I, I think it's it would be best in, in ideal times, and we've seen how good a neutral site tournament can be in, in that area of the country. Uh, and so, I, I it, it is we can we can pine about the days of two thousand seven, two thousand six, whatever the heart of the whenever you want to peg the uh, the peak of the WCHA Final Five. Um, but just I don't feel like those days are ever coming back. So uh, we we have been. I think I don't know when it comes to like the NCAA tournament, we're all about campus sites. And so. I feel like it is in that regard, you're going to you're, you're trying for the best atmosphere. It's 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 become more and more of a struggle to generate a peak atmosphere at the X when you're even in good years, you're 
drawing what 12 or 13,000, which is two thirds full, if that a little bit over half full. So I don't know. It seems like they're, they're going for, uh, they're going to go for uh, atmosphere and attendance. And I'm sure the, I mean, the, the conference is, is still going to get a cut. I mean, like for the quarterfinal games, those tickets that you buy for a St. Cloud home series in the playoffs, that all goes to the conference. Right. And I would assume that that's going to be the same case when they're expanding the the campus site aspect of the tournament from just the quarterfinals to the semis and to the uh, championship game. I mean, obviously, the home team can get their concessions and whatever else, whatever revenue they can generate in the building. But the actual ticket sales will go to the conference itself. And then that's split up throughout the uh, the colleges. Can they make as much or more in that model than they were at the X probably. So, I mean, it might just be as simple as economically. This is a more feasible model for the, for the conference because you're not able to sell 20,000 seats per game as you once did way back when the NCHC wasn't able, ever able to do that uh, as a conference, but the WCHA did. And that sort of dream slowly died over the last 10 years, I suppose. I'm not really the one to ask, though, because you're the real uh, frozen face-off stan on this show because that was a yearly event, an outing for you. So that let was, me know, what, what, yeah. what is your, what's your take on this? Um, I mean, the main thing was it's, it's disappointing but not surprising. Um, and, you know, you, you talk a lot about that, those factors, and, you know, just from a, a, just a bottom line aspect you know just the cost of renting out the facility you know and and the staffing and all of that it just um you know college hockey has drastically changed um in, in that in the, in that sense and the it just wasn't really feasible um i did hope that it would grow um and i think the NCHC probably just kind of saw the writings on the wall when it came to it, just that it wasn't, it, 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 we didn't have the trajectory to kind of sustain it with, with the price of probably, um, you know, what it would be to kind of rent it out for, for that weekend. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. My, my dad and I have gone, um, nearly every year since 2000 we only missed when it was in grand forks and obviously due to covid um so it's yeah it's a little bit of a bittersweet um for me you know people you know especially in minnesota you know had father-son bonding trips and usually they've involved hunting trips or things along those lines but you know for my dad and i it was this this trip um, that he got, you know, for me when I was like a what sophomore in high school. Um, and you know, that was kind of a bad time for me in general. Like, I don't think any male really likes early high school. I think just trying to find a place, like, it's just awkward. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's something that uh, I've looked forward to ever since. And yeah, it's sad that it's, that it's going, that, it, that it's going to go by the wayside. So, um, you know, so it's, but it, but it makes sense. I, I didn't see the growth. Uh, they probably saw the numbers and were like, we, we can't do it. I don't know if I care for, um, Heather Weems talk about how, you know, she had a quote in there about the health of the players. And I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit of stress. Just say it's about money. Like we all know it's about money and that's fine. Um, what, but what about the turn? The, what, what about the health of the, I, I missed that. What was the argument? Oh, it was, I am, I can pull it up the actual statement from the NCHC. Um, but yeah, there was a quote from, um, Heather Weems that it was about how I'm dying to hear this. Yeah. As you look that up, cause one of the, practical effects of this uh will be i mean aside from the who's hosting and the revenue the money aspect of it one sort of tangible aspect from a coaching or team side is that there's there's one additional week of this tournament so it goes from 
a two week tournament where you're playing the quarterfinals one weekend, the best of three series. And then the following weekend, you're playing the final four teams in one neutral site. And you're doing this, the semifinals uh, followed by the finals back to back nights. Now you're sort of splitting up the semifinals and the finals over two weeks. So as a result, they mentioned in their press release that I read that they're starting the regular season one week earlier. So they're going to start conference games in, in the late part of October. And I wonder if they're going to move up the second half too, because like this week, this year they're starting the second half on the 12th and 13th of January, maybe move it up a week um, next year. It might result in one fewer bye week which coaches will complain about um, if they are given the opportunity to complain. Mm. So that's one practical result. Did you find that quote from, uh, from commish? All right. So um, the NCHC frozen face. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, quote, the NCHC frozen face off was introduced shortly after the inception of the conference as a designated tournament in the twin cities, as the development, as the membership discussed the future of the NCHC in an increasingly competitive NCAA Division I environment, the rest and recovery available to our student athletes in the final weeks of the season became of paramount importance. The expansion of the three week playoff immediately preceding NCAA regional play maintains the competitiveness of our frozen face off championship while providing our teams with a better schedule for travel and rest. So the argument would be instead of playing two games in a weekend at the frozen face-off, then splitting it up between the semifinal one week, one game, one weekend, and the final game the following weekend. I guess if you lose the semifinals, that gives you an extra week of rest. I could see, I, co- I could see coaches being like, great. Yeah. <laughs> but then you get I into mean, the whole rest and rust thing. Like what's better for you to be, to be well rested or then that means you're rusty. So you can have it both ways. That's that's why, like, looking at that quote, I'm like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Maybe I'll ask her at the next uh, student board meeting for District 742. I can say, hey, (laughs) what do you mean by this quote? This is weird. But um, I don't know. That's, I mean, the reason that they gave. And it's like, you can just say it's about money. It's fine. Like, it, it just, we all know it. Yeah, money or like logistics. Yeah, you know, it could have been or that logi- the, yeah. it could have been that the XL says we don't want you. It might have it might yeah, not have been true. like their choice. I wonder too, like because the first what five six years of this was at the Target Center. If you feel would it have been would it have played out any differently? I'm guessing no. But would it have been any different if they would have just stuck with the X from year one? Which I'm not even sure if they had a choice there because I know Big Ten. They no, were they flipping off choice. with with yeah. Joe with Joe Lewis at this. They only did that two or three years before they threw in the white flag. But uh, flipping off <laughs> was the was the Target Center experience. Was was that did that derail the momentum at all, or was this kind of doomed from the start? I I feel like this was just doomed from the start. Just I mean, just you know, going and whatnot, and it, it was. I don't know. It was still an incredibly fun weekend and I still have a lot of memories from it, obviously, but you know, I just thought it would take off maybe a little bit more and it just, it just hasn't. Um, and you know, and now we get into this whole, I don't, I don't know about this whole playoff scenario. I don't know the point then of having a three game quarter final. Like I don't, understand that aspect of it if that's the only time if we're going to campus sites anyway i don't know it just what are you saying like do a do a best of three for the semis as well or not do best of threes for the quarters like just do one and done's there i guess either either one like i don't know it's just it's just so weird it's like to have one full series in the mix and then well, yeah, if That's you're it. if you're really uh, striving for the health and well being argument, yeah, then, uh, a best of three probably would go by the way. You, you're not going to have an uh, you're not going to add a best of three for the semis if we're talking about wrapping the uh, players in bubble wrap. So I would doubt that's going to happen. But I, I I love the series. If it was up to me, I'd play the uh, the final. It'd be like a best of five if it was up to me. <laughs> but that ain't going to happen. Uh, so. I guess we'll uh, we'll have to be happy with what they have here. Um, and, and two, I don't know if we 
because I remember we had a whole show in the off season about when Arizona State came in and speculating about how the playoffs would alter. And I, I kind of correctly nailed how they would do the have an eight nine playoff. I didn't nail the fact that they would do the eight nine game in a in the sight of the one seed, which is what they're going to do next year when they still have the X as the final culmination of the tournament. But they're going to continue that eight nine game at the one seed. Uh, for the years that it is going to be all campus sites. Again, I don't know if we actually touched on it in the, in the podcast, but do you like that idea of playing that at the one seed, or would you prefer that to be at one of the two, you know, like the eighth, the eighth seed would host the ninth seed or what do you, what do you like? Uh, do, do you like that I, setup? I mean, I don't overall, but I bet there's some sort of reason for it. Some sort of travel thing. Now, it's the same amount of flights, no matter which way you kind of slice it. Um, if, if there are flights involved, obviously, I mean, you know, Minnesota Duluth, the way that they're trending might have to, you know, you know, drive to St. Cloud when we're number one next year. Um, whereas Miami would have to fly, you know, hypothetically speaking. Um, and whereas, but I bet it, it has more to do with, you know, when that game is played and then rushing to get there. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. The benefit like, of whoever wins that game can just hang around until that weekend. They don't have to yeah. travel on short notice. I think that's the main reason. And you also get a benefit if you're the one seed, you get a little extra revenue. And it's kind of like a little bonus for winning the Penrose because I don't think you're going to get a sellout in these eight, nine games of if it's at North yeah. Dakota, for instance. But you know, you get a opportunity to get a couple thousand fans in in the game for the toilet bowl. Um, you know, that's extra revenue that you weren't planning on earlier in the year. It's not in your budget. So I don't think that those teams will will decline the opportunity to open their doors for some more revenue. So you get a little extra extra bonus that way. I don't mind it for an odd number of teams. It'll it'll suffice until they get a tenth team, I suppose. Then we're gonna have to I don't know what they would do then. Like, uh, I guess we can cross that bridge when they get to it, if they do. But um, if you get to 10, then I, I, I don't know how you're going to do a three round, three weekend tournament after that. But again, it's all speculation at this point. But <clears throat> yeah, it was about time that this would, that this is going to happen, unfortunately. And yeah, as you said, just the, uh, just the two now neutral site conference tournaments and both on the East Coast with the ECAC and, and Hockey East with Atlantic hockey moving to campus sites a couple of years ago, maybe just this last year might've been their first time doing it, but um, you know, and hockey East and ECAC, I mean, ECAC was completely untouched by the, uh, uh, the realignment um, kind of dust up that happened 10 years ago, which resulted in the formation of the NCHC and the big 10. And then the WCHA slash ECHA, the ECAC didn't lose anybody, didn't gain anybody. Uh, Hockey East's really only effect was they added Notre Dame for a couple of years. And so those, the, they could look at their uh, neutral site tournament and say, see, you know, it works. But they have the benefit of having a bunch of teams in a centralized location. You're not spread out like the NCHC is. And they've, yeah. they've had the benefit too of not having any jolt in their conference membership. Which, yeah, I've, it just it, it is one of many what if, what ifs. But what if the old WCHA was still still alive? Would we still be? Would it still be at the X? Would it still be getting seventeen thousand per game? And it's it's hard to know. It, that's a hypothetical that we can't really test uh, in a real world example. We'd like to think that that would be the same, but you know, I think the nature of uh, spectator sports has changed. I, I I would imagine if you look at the hockey East tournament, I bet you their attendance isn't as it's fallen from whatever their peak was. So, but obviously it's still uh, feasible enough for them to continue on with their neutral site where the play where the Bruins play for the, for hockey East, they play in local Lake Placid for ECAC. So it's obviously working there, but it's, the ECAC it's on a smaller scale with the hockey East. It's much more concentrated, market and one that's hasn't been affected as much by the realignment um activity so 
kind of an apples to apples oranges to say that they are able to do this where the NCHC decided to fold up shop with their neutral site uh, tournament. But in any case, end of an era. It's it is sad to see, but uh, I guess this is how it's it's going. And I'd rather, yeah, I would rather play a title game like if we're thinking about last year. Um, you know, I would rather play a title game situation in a in a building that's at least got some, you know, a home ice advantage rather than, you know, a building that was what a quarter full, if that, for that title game last year, um, you know, with yeah. so much on the line, you'd like to play. I, I bet CC would like to have played, you know, you know, I can't even say that St. Cloud would have sold that game out, you know, because that's, they don't really sell games out period. That's kind of what I was worried about too. When I was thinking about, um, you know, moving to campus. So I was like, yeah, you want to be in front of a packed arena. I was like, God, I hope the herb would be packed for that, but I can't even confidently say that it would be. Well, and as I mean, when I don't know if it's different now, I would assume it's not. But back when I was a season ticket holder, the uh, you'd get those first round games as part of your season ticket package. But mm-hmm. for that was like the one weekend that students would have to pay. Like when I, yeah. when we were students, we would have to pay to get into the, the playoff games, WCHA first round. Whereas mm-hmm. everything else you could pay because, because that money went straight to the conference. You weren't that wasn't money that was put up by the university. So I don't know if what's going to change. If you're a season tick holder, do you get potentially all the playoff games? If St. Cloud were to host, you know, be the number one seed and they were to go and, and host the title game, would that be included in season ticket packages? And then also if you're not a season ticket holder, like, or if, like if you're a student, would those playoff games beyond the first round, would those also be out of pocket expenses? Because yeah. that's why you look at, Last couple of years in particular, St. Cloud has hosted these playoff games. You know, their regular season average would be around 4,000, which is, you know, a dip from its glory days. But the playoff games would maybe be 2,500 because you're not getting as many students in and and, and whatnot. So, yeah, their, their playoffs uh, attendance has been worse than regular season. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if they're going to address an easier way. Maybe you buy like a flat rate for all the playoff games. I, I don't know if that's realistic but um that is one thing that okay because I, I think in a lot of people's minds is think north dakota okay yeah because they did that the covid year where north dakota um hosted it all and said like yeah that that, that that makes sense like because north dakota will sell out all the games but yeah st cloud's not like they're a, a for sure draw on playoffs and really anybody else in the conference uh based on the pricing structure of where the money goes for these ticket sales um I don't think it's a, a sure bet that you're going to have a packed house. But I, again, I'd rather have 3,000 at the Herb than 5,000 at the X for a title game. I'll say that. Yeah. So be improvement there. But uh, certainly I don't think this is a move to, you know, like the Gopher and uh, Michigan title games the last couple of years. Those have been really packed houses and great atmospheres. I'm not sure if we're going to exactly transition smoothly into that. but. I guess we can hope. Yeah, exactly. And I'd like to hope the, also the community does go ahead and turn out for it. But I mean, if we get to a point where it's, you know, St. Cloud is hosting against North Dakota. I mean, you know that there'll be a lot of green also in the stands. So, or if you got to go, go out to Denver, like who's going to make that trip on a week's notice. Yeah, and from, a, from, a Saint, well. from a Saint Cloud fan. Well, I'm saying like okay, Saint yeah. Cloud plays out there. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, some of those it'd be great. Like you play North Dakota or you play Duluth or something like that. Like at least you're going to be close. But some of these might be uh, more difficult for Saint Cloud fans mm-hmm. to to travel to. Um, but you know when I was talking, you know, to my dad about this, and you know he did float at the idea. I mean if. If uh, if Sioux Falls and Fargo keep rotating NCAA regionals, um, you know maybe maybe that's on the docket uh, to to spend uh, a couple days in in Fargo and Sioux Falls. Uh, you know, might not so are be you, the are Twin you going to do but... are you going to do the the last two years of the X? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, and because I think Sioux Falls got has a regional this year. Fargo's got it next year. Mm-hmm. And then I think again, it's Sioux Falls and then Fargo. I believe the two years so. after that. So maybe that they've announced be... it that far, right? I... 
at least out to 26 or 27. Maybe they haven't. I know Sioux Falls has two coming up, so it might, it might just be 2026, I think, is what they're out to. I was reading an article about that. I don't know where, but they said they're going to announce the next batch of regionals. If not, uh, like by the tournament time this year or maybe early in the season next year, like somewhat soon, like within the next year. I always like to, that's always intriguing when I find out who the new, who the new the test name. market is. Like this year we got <laughs> Maryland Heights, uh, Missouri. Uh, I don't know what the, I'd rather have one of those than uh, another three years of Allentown. Um, of or, Allentown. You know, I guess Fargo's fine because it's somewhat close to, St. Cloud, but um, I would expect them to continue on because they've at least had some decent attendance there. But it's always nice to see who they who they got, and maybe maybe Sioux Falls will be a regular if they if they have a good showing uh, this year. Yeah, we shall see. You never know, uh, Providence in Providence, or if uh, that's if this the Midwest. Year. That's this year. If if the Midwest Regional is going to be in in. Uh, Oh, you said Allentown or Allentown. But. Yeah, will it will it be in the central time zone? That's that's yes. not been a hundred percent certainty the last few years. Which I know I'm kind of springing you this on you, but I don't know if you saw uh, Steve Medcalf's uh, comments, uh, Hockey East Commissioner, talking to the Boston Globe about uh, about regionals, um, and basically give that give that sound bite to me. Um, uh, let's see. What did he say? I'm um, just talking about, you know, regionals. Cause people are talking again about, you know, bringing regionals on campus. And, you know, we've talked about that also on, uh, on before I am more of a fan of just getting rid of regionals in general. Um, bringing them on campus, isn't going to magically like, like be your golden ticket to a lot of sales. So, um, but, uh, Again, Steve Metcalf is the Hockey East Commissioner um, since 2020. Um, he said, he th I think the vast majority of coaches prefer the current model because of the neutrality that it provides, which it doesn't, uh, you know, first and foremost. Um, and also, if you pay to host a regional, I mean, that's where you're placed no matter what, even if you're the four seed. So, um you're not having a home ice advantage and they think that's important. So he's obviously, you know, he's a commissioner. He's going to go bat for the coaches that, that makes sense. Is he just talking um, about I, hockey, hockey East coaches? Cause I feel like, is that really true? Or most coach, I, cause I feel like I've heard more and more coaches be vocal about returning to campus sites for NCAA. Like in the last I, couple of years, I, it doesn't say in the article or he didn't even elaborate. Cause he just said a vast majority of coaches. So we can take that for what it is. I think that, I mean, they, they, they like the idea of neutrality, but as you mentioned in practice, how it's become is there's never really a true neutral venue no. because I mean, there can be with like the, the Maryland Heights is probably going to be the closest thing to it because we know Lindenwood's not going to make it. And there's really no one even very close to the, like even Fargo, you could say like there was enough teams and how the Fargo regional worked out last year. You had enough close teams to go there. Yeah. I, I don't know. That was somewhat quasi neutral, but yeah, the Providence regionals in Providence or Penn state when they get to host in, in Allentown. Yes. It's not their home arena, but um, they are the host regional and they're obviously the closest thing there. And so are, are those truly neutral? I don't really think they are. So and the ones that have the best atmosphere are the ones where a host team is involved. And you get I have situations like St. Cloud playing North Dakota in Fargo for a trip to the frozen four. And, you know, it's 95% green in that building. Is that truly neutral? I, I don't think so, but huh. I don't know. Uh, Metcalf is not um, sure that it would be reasonable ask, adding that there'll be added expense to teams and officiating crews traveling to single games on separate weekends, not to mention the fans who have attended conference championships and have bought tickets to the frozen four. 
Um, that second point is obviously negated anyway by the fact of what we have anyway. Um, it's the that's the same argument. So you know, if, and, and and he's saying single games for these regionals. That's where I would say that first round at least should be best two out of three. So you can bring the officials and all that. Give them for two games plus, maybe three games, not just for a single game. Make a whole weekend out of it. I think the impetus is not on just the NCAA, but it's on all college hockey to make sure we get some good regional sites. And my understanding is that some regional sites that are from the Western part of the country that will be in the mix next time that will help. Oh, so it's like you didn't bid. He's like, you know, random people on Twitter make that same argument every year. Just put in a bid. What are you complaining yeah. about? Three Eastern teams getting uh, three of the four regionals. Just put in a bid. Nobody puts in a bid. Yeah, but have you seen the have you seen the attendance of these things? Who wants to lose money for a weekend? That's that's what you're really asking them. Just just lose money, mm-hmm. take a bath, and then you then at least you can get back to Steve Metcalf and say, "But we put in a bid." Is well, this a good enough? Re- is this an att- what did he say? An attractive Western regional host? I don't know what exactly his verbiage was, but uh, kind of blaming the victim there. It would be nice to be able mm. to be on the East Coast and have your biggest, uh, have your biggest uh, travel series for the year, meaning you go 200 miles in one direction and never have to jump on a plane all year long. It'd be nice. But I digress. I'll look. A look at future sites demonstrates more balanced locations with Maryland Heights and Sioux Falls hosting along with Springfield and Providence, Fargo and Toledo um, on tap for 2025 Sioux Falls and Loveland are in the rotation for 2026 bids are being accepted for 27 and 28. So see where those 27 and 28 sites are. I I can't wait. (laughs) So I don't know. Like, Again, like my whole thing and what I like, the only real downside I could possibly see is just ESPN broadcasting these games. Um, If we do it, you know, kind of my way of just higher seed hosts, um, strict back at integrity just because it's easiest and then just kind of go that way with it. You know, having eight camera crews in different spots, you know, maybe there's a way, you know, you can stagger the games enough where you can have, you know, crews and announcers to kind of be able to to go. But I think you still have enough talent to, you know, to go ahead and um, have all those games. Um, yeah. You, with you a can, crew. So. You can use freelancers. You can, I mean, ESPN's got a, they got to put a camera crew and a, a color commentator and a play by play guy for all these ECAC men's and women's games and hockey East games. Uh, you can get Jim Rich. Yeah. Jim Rich is, is available if you need him. Like, uh, <laughs> I think you can find four more crews. If, if that's I would, I would love, point. I would love Jim Rich, Gino Parrish covering a, let's go with a Denver, um, Brown. mass Lowell game. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say Brown, get Brown in there. Yeah. I think they would, they would have fun so, with that. So, so as long as you give them the exactly. sheet with the explaining overtime, I think they'd, yeah. be, they'd be gold. Well, that's easy. Uh, that That's a lot easier. It's a lot easier I mean, in NCAA. In time, NCAA. Yes, in tournament yep, time. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, um, anyway, I just thought those comments were kind of interesting. Again, it's like, he didn't offer any type of solutions. He's like, Nope, we're going to stick with this. And again, his comments about vast majority of coaches when, like you said, I feel like a lot more coaches now are saying, uh, we got to do something to change this. Cause you know, in front of 2000 people, um, you know, or what looks like 200 people, um, you know, like uh what bridgeport last year or i can't remember what there was one regional especially that was very poorly attended it looked like that wasn't even in the west last year um, was was somewhat okay because you had like the i'm uh, thinking of two years ago well like the year that st cloud made the tyler game 
those were like a couple hundred fans in the stands because of COVID restrictions. Because of COVID, that's but, true. Uh, yeah, there's been some bad ones. Uh, they're going back to Toledo in a couple of years, and I don't think that's a very good idea. But last year they lucked out, but it might be because St. Cloud when St. Cloud was at Toledo, right? And they had right. the can the cotton candy guy um, that was like just going around with a big old stick full of cotton candy, trying to sell it, like going down all the aisles, and it's like nobody was picking just up. Just kind of nobody was picking up, but he was like like clearly in like blocking the action of the bottom portion, just a big old stick like of. Like eight different bags of flavors of cotton candy. And I'm like, buddy, not during play. What are you doing? Anyway, yeah, you get some of those. And, and you could just shout now. It's like, hey, you want cotton candy? You don't have to walk up and down those steps. It's not like, you know, they'll be able to hear you. So, anyway. It's always good to check in. I, I like doing those. This one was sort of impromptu, but I like when you have like those long quotes and then we can pick them apart one by one see the 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 folly of their arguments yeah. this is a good one I, yeah. I learned a lot about steve metcalf i'm i'm glad you brought that up it's yeah. a good segment yeah. I, did, I, I didn't even prep you on that one either so we've had, I, we've had two apologize. extended we've had two of those sessions today with commissioner quotes that, that'll be a new segment here <laughs> like dissecting need, commissioner that... quotes da, 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 da. we did we did new sounder for that so it's It'll be right next to our Wisconsin rural update sounder is the commissioner. I, quotes. I, I might have to do something with that. I'll workshop it and get back to you. <laughs> workshop it and see what we got. So uh, questions. Uh, Chester, I believe. Was it Chester? Uh, nope. Eric. What do we got going on here? Hold on a second. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, oh, we'll we'll go with Dan Jacobson first. Um, how hard is it to be academically ineligible while majoring in communications at UMD? <laughs> Which is a very good question. Uh, we could ask Cole Spicer that question, as uh, Cole Spicer is uh, not going to be partake in the Egon. second half of the season uh, for Minnesota Duluth and uh, academically ineligible. So he didn't, uh, they didn't, I found it interesting they didn't go the Cam Reed route, um, where it was a little bit more of a, I mean, I was, I I wouldn't say I was like failing, but yeah, I was struggling a little bit. <laughs> they went nope. Uh, Sandlin was just like nope. He's academically ineligible, and he will not be uh, with uh, Minnesota Duluth for the second half of the season. Uh, played a lot of minutes on uh, uh, Minnesota Duluth's top line, and had um, I believe five goals on the season, which was tied for their team lead, um, or second um on their team lead or tied for second on their team so it um big blow for them and uh i could i bet you're just uh you're just heartbroken by it andrew Uh, (laughs) it's just a permanent smile on his face throughout the whole segment yeah i yeah i'm weeping um in in sympathy here for duluth uh i mean i guess the obvious the obvious joke would be that well, St. Cloud could pick them up. They, they have no such uh, compunctions about academic standards. Uh, a little, <laughs> little bit uh, southeast of Duluth there, but uh, um, he's but a I don't center. Know, can, can well, I mean, you, a little bit more center depth. He so. wouldn't be able to transfer in midseason to another team, a la Swankler did, right? Like he'd have to no. sit out probably, or he could just go yeah. to like some juniors, like Cam Reed did. So mm. yeah. Well, right now it looks like Youngstown picked him up. Oh, right, so he's, he's going to go back to the ECHL. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe so. this isn't the last we've seen of, of Cole Spicer. Maybe he uh, joins up with another NCHC team or CCHA. Maybe you, you take a step down <laughs> to the, to a lesser conference. And Oh yeah. The lesser conference, the academic standards of, you know, St. Thomas or Augustana. Yeah. Or Michigan what? tech. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of dummies there at Michigan <laughs> tech. That would take him. Well, so, yeah, but you got like Lake State. They're like not known for 
for much academically. <laughs> Ferris thing, you know. Ferris yeah, is like a Ferris. what's Ferris is like a golf course maintenance is their like niche uh, <laughs> academic oh, field. Go. Seriously, that's like though they lead the country in golf course management. In greenskeepers, <laughs> greenskeepers with degrees. Yes, nice, nice. Um, so it's uh, obviously um, <laughs> and. Dan Jacobson, who will be probably driving to Milwaukee listening to this podcast, um, you know, if he's still going or if he's going to go the Cole Spicer route and just be like, yeah, I don't want to go either. Um, I just I just don't know how, like, I, I, again, it's just my understanding that, you know, these hockey programs have so much, like so many resources at, available for them. So like you have to really try or really be addicted to Xbox and just not go a la Jason Wozlowski, um, to, to not, uh, to be academically ineligible. Cause I mean, it's you impressive. can get all the help you need. So it's impressive. Yeah. So we'll see, uh, what ends up with him, um, and, and where he's going to end up. Um, but, uh, just kind of an interesting little turn, uh, for a bad season that's getting worse for Duluth, um, you know, what feels like every passing moment. Um, uh, yeah, Eric's question, um, you know, ideal 10th uh, NCHC team. Um, is it a nearby program like uh, Mankato or Bemidji or someone else out there? Minnesota schools would throw the CCHA um, into a regional flux, but it would be fun for this BSU uh, trip to have some conference points on the line. Um, yeah, and what Mankato threw out a feeler there not too long ago as well. Um, if I remember correctly, or there was something, well, it would have been those... a while ago, it would have been during our first iteration of the podcast when they oh, was it that long ago? Jeez. Arizona State applied, perhaps they've applied again since then. I can't remember that happening, but I remember they put in an application like around 2017, I'm gonna say, with ASU. That was like before ASU had its facility in. They were still pretty new as a program, so I don't know if they had a, a great chance at that time. Plus, Mankato really hadn't started their like great run in the CCHA, well, the old WCHA slash CCHA. Like McKay hadn't started there yet, so oh, like, sure their enough. their days of being a number one seed perennially in the tournament. That's right. Hadn't I'm just started. old, but those days are seemingly kind of over with as well. Like with Hastings gone and them kind of being fairly mediocre uh, this year. I'm not sure if the, the stature of that program is as attractive to the NCHC as it would have been say two, three years ago. I said it before the year when we had that Arizona state, like welcoming them to the turn or welcoming them to the conference podcast. I put out there that St. Thomas, maybe not my preference, but I w- that was my prediction that they're going to be team 10 just because of the money involved with them. the, attractiveness of the uh, university the location of that i sort of had that the location of them being in st paul was sort of oh that's nice for the frozen face off well, you can throw that out the window but the fact that they're getting a, a new facility coming up uh plus their affiliation with the summit league which is where josh uh, fenton is at this point there seems there's been some rumors at least that nchc and summit league have been thinking of doing some sort of affiliation cross sport kind of uh, organization between the two conferences. So St. Thomas is already a part of that. So, and they are, I mean, as far as their competition wise, I mean, they're having a, a good year this year, comparatively speaking, the other CCHA teams. So I don't think you're going to, they're not like the dog, like the doormat that's going to maybe unseat Miami out of last place that we thought maybe at the summertime this year. So if anything, I think St. Thomas's uh, profile has has risen a little bit since the summer when I made that call. So I'm, I'm going to stick with them, and and I don't I don't know if that's going to be this off season. Like it might be until they get their new facility, which I believe is in 2025, the 25 26 season. So it might coincide with them getting into their new barn. But I'll stick with them. I'm going to still say I think it's going to be St. Thomas will be number ten. What about you? Um. I don't know. I just feel like a lot of a lot of these teams with the CCHA 
Like I, I, I just feel like they're in a pretty good place right now. So I always kind of keep coming back to Lindenwood just, you know, to expand and do a completely new market. Um, it is a little bit of a more of an unknown. And I realize that, you know, especially for us being, you know, or the NCHC kind of priding themselves as being top tier, you know, <laughs> conference and then having Lindenwood who, you know, hasn't done anything as of yet. You know, I know that's kind of a stretch, but um, yeah, you know, it's, you know, we always have to, we also have to remember that, you know, having, you know, so many teams in one league, you know, in the WCHA days, you know, was not really the norm when you look out East, when you have in, you know, a, you know, what feels like a 50 mile square mile, you know, radius or so, or a 50 mile radius, um, you know, you might have three or four different conferences right there. So it's, so it's just not proximity. So I mean, it, there is something to be said also to having a mix of two different conferences because of the pairwise implications that make this series so much interest, so much more interesting than it normally would be. But, um, you know, at, at the same point, I, I, I don't know if, you know, you know, where the CCHA is at, um, you know, what would be the, the team to kind of, you know, get to the, the NCHC, my Right away, when I thought Augustana, I thought that would have been a good fit with their, um, you know, with their proximity and, you know, right on what I twenty nine I think is the freeway there in South Dakota. They might be um, right there with St. Thomas. Now that you're thinking about that, with their sort of decent year, like they're competitive yeah. right off the bat. They they're getting a new facility. They are which like opens a up market. in like what a couple weeks. A couple weeks. And so, they are, unlike St. Thomas, which, yes, it's the Twin Cities. You don't have someone literally there right now, but you still already have two Minnesota teams. This would be, like, right between, literally, Grand Forks and Omaha. So you get, yeah. like, you get that market. And they're not, like, they don't have a, you know, same with St. Thomas, like, but they're not, like, entrenched CCHA members. I mean, literally, Augustana hasn't even begun a full-fledged membership of that conference yet there's still sort of an affiliate quasi status so that might not be so far off i think conference Linden, conference with benefits i've always i've said lindenwood i think has no chance i don't think any of the ncc teams really respect them i think like bradbury passes, i mean that's probably true yeah bradbury passes gas when someone brings up lindenwood <laughs> Um, I'm thinking that, uh, I, I think right. that, um, what, it, again, it, it, because the NCHC prides itself on the quality of the team that would, would, that would hold yeah. back, uh, St. Thomas and Augustana as far as tradition of success at the D1 level. It's what held back among other things, facilities well, but it's what held back Arizona state as well. And you can make the case that, they really fit the bill the least among what you, are now the nine NCHC teams. You could make the case that that's what held St. Cloud State back from being an original member of the NCHC. Same with uh, Western um, Michigan, which is the other yeah. one of the afterthoughts. And so now that I'm thinking this, like, because I would have, I would have passed gas in the past when Alaska's name was brought up, but they're having another decent year, and they play a lot of NCHC teams. Like they, they play Denver, North Dakota and St. Cloud this year. Um, the one benefit, if you can call it that with having Alaska in your conference is that any travel up there is compensated with two extra home games or two extra games. You get to add to your, you can add additional games based on the Alaska exemption. So like, would you rather put in, would you rather uh, have Augustana or St. Thomas, or let's even say Lindenwood in the conference? Um, or would you have a maybe a step up in competition with Alaska? Plus, if you ever go up there, you can schedule two more home games as like a, where you can't do that with anybody else that's out of outside of Alaska. So I don't I think with Alaska, their only chance is like they got to make a tournament one of these years, not just like be the last team out. But if they can continue a sustained run of decent play up there. Mm. And the thing about them is they're not they're definitely not going back to the CCHA. CCHA because that league 
literally did a Minnesota goodbye to force <laughs> them, Anchorage and Huntsville out of the league. Instead of booting them out of the WCHA the league, they resurrected a league in mothballs and didn't invite them. So there's no way that they're ever going to crawl back to Alaska. So, and I don't see obviously the Western or the Eastern leagues picking up Alaska. So I really think their only hope, unless there is some big groundswell of other West coast teams that emerge in the next couple of years, their real own, only hope would be the NCHC. And like I said, it's a something that I wouldn't have given much thought to or credence to even like this time, six months ago, even, but, Seeing as I think that Largen has got a good thing going there, and uh, I think they've played themselves into the competition. I still think it's a long shot, but I'll throw no. it out there as 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 a long shot contender. I uh, I love the idea. Also, the fact that Alaska would probably be what pretty dominant in the uh, in the CCHA. Um, oh yeah. They- yeah. I mean, they got swept by Northern Michigan, I guess. So their their worst week, so. worst results of the year. I mean, they they won and tied at Tech early in the season, and as we mentioned, Tech is the per- winning percentage leader in the clubhouse so far this year. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think yeah, if they were in that league, I might give them the upper hand. Uh, I probably would too. But yeah, that's. That's not, and also that would lot, make but... me feel better about losing to them too. So that would help. Yeah, we should want them to do better. Uh, we should want yeah. them to win as many. I mean, they should win a lot of their remaining games because a lot of them are against Lindenwood and LIU and Anchorage. Other than they really, if they if they have any chance of getting the term getting into the tournament this year, they got to win at least one of those games in Grand Forks coming up because that's really their only series against a good team coming out or to, mm-hmm. to the, well, I guess Arizona state too. But as far as like current top 10 teams, like North Dakota is really the only test they have in the second half. So uh, like they did last year when they, when they won a game in Denver, they got to at least win one of those games in grand forks to make it interesting for them, I think. Mm-hmm. And it could happen. They're a decent team. Yep. Um, last question. Um, uh, makers and Coke uh, or a white Russian tonight. So Eric, I'm sorry that I'm getting to you late on this one, but uh, I say, yes, have both. So I don't I know think if it's a good yeah. answer. Um, I'll go the makers and Coke yeah. over the white. I'm not a huge fan of white Russians. There are, there are, right. Well, but yeah, yeah. Well, the dude abides. Dude, um, this dude can abide without it. Just fine. <laughs> Um, go Huskies Woo did respond to that. Say, uh, makers and Coke, hold the Coke, add bitters and add sweet Maruth, which, um, so he's making a Manhattan. He is making a Manhattan. Exactly. Well, um, for me, a Manhattan has rye instead of bourbon, but that's, that might be picky. But. <laughs> that's, that's a little picky, but I mean, you're a brandy old fashioned guy. So that's, I think the, like, by the book, um, uh, Recipe calls for Canadian whiskey or rye instead for, of uh, for, 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 for Manhattan. Manhattan. Yes. I think so too. Um, and then <laughs> once we, once we are graduated, it's time to stop using soda mixers also was his, his take on that. And I think that, I mean, I get it. I get it. I think it's a little harsh though, because I am a fan it's a of little a, us. Uh, makers, and, makers and Coke is, is a good drink. I think oh, it's exactly. when you're out of college, the, that's the end of diet colas as a mixers. <laughs> you you got to go the full flavor. That's, uh, that's, I think that's the end of Yag in general as well. <laughs> like there's no more Yag bombs at that point. Like, yeah, I don't know the last time I've had a Yag bomb and I don't think I'm going to go back. It's the end of so. drop shots. Yes, the, dro- the drop shot era of your life ended <laughs> drop once you or the left pixie, St- once you left the Stearns County line, <laughs> the pixie stick era as well. <laughs> um, uh, but I am also like I'm a sucker for like a seven and seven. Um, Another or good one. Yeah. like so, so anything or along the ginger, along the ginger ale and Irish whiskey, that, like two gingers or. Mm. God, yeah, nothing wrong with a, a soda plus a spirit awesome. drink. And, and really, easy. What, a, 
a little bit of soda is in a Long Island, and that'll uh, there you go. That's what gives so. it the nutrition. <laughs> that's that's what gives it's the a little bit, little bit of uh, yeah, exactly. And I'm pretty sure there's a uh, quite a fair amount of buffaloes as well that have some kind of a soda mixer involved. <laughs> So yeah, little, are you going to go to, like, are you going to go to Ryan Malone and tell him that, uh, excuse right. me, sir. <laughs> yeah. Pump the brakes there on the, uh, soda <laughs> mixing, uh, snobbery. Uh, yeah. Right. G- exactly. G- that was maybe, maybe a little, maybe that was a little harsh on our part. No, maybe good. not. I don't, I don't think I like so. that. We book get booked end this show with some booze book- talk. I liked it. Started it and ended it. Some booze talk. So, yeah, maybe a nice, um, yeah, because there's what there's two distilleries now in St. Cloud that or the St. Cloud area that are within like, uh, uh, I was gonna say like a nine iron away, but obviously a lot longer than that. But uh, there's Iron Street, which is um, on the east side of town, and then yeah, that's the one over by the uh, the recycling plants where uh, Gritty St. Cloud. Yeah, it's kind of part of their tour. Like, where's yeah, the other? That, where's and the, the other, history uh, history of the Amtrak through right. Saint Cloud as well? So correct. Um, uh, Saint Joe uh, has a distillery, oh. Obink Distillery. Um, is that like actually, downtown Saint Joe? Um, is there a downtown Saint Joe? Oh, yeah, like where that like that bad <laughs> habit is? No. Uh, well, I mean, no. Whatever, Minnesota like, Street. Obviously, it's like drink. a couple of blocks away because it's St. Joe, but it's on it's the other like out, side. Out in the boonies, like closer to St. John's. Correct. Like, okay. No, um, I mean, if you're if you're heading like from St. Cloud and then out to like 94 and you're going through it, whereas like Bad Habit would be on, you take a left to go into like, yes, downtown, which downtown St. Joe is actually pretty cool. It's yeah. got a lot of cool places. There's a good um, restaurant that's right next to that Bad Habit. I can't remember. It's like an Italian joint. that's uh, pretty good. But, There's Be- Bella Cucina. I think that's what it um, is. It's, it's um, and then solid. they've got um, a they've got Crew, which is like a, a Creole a place. wine bar. Oh, uh, I didn't. I don't so, know about that. Crew. Yeah. How do you spell that? I um, thought it was C R U, like a wine bar. No, uh, C R E W E. So it's got um, a lot of like uh, yeah Creole Louisiana fair. And whatnot, Jum- which I've heard like, is, salad jambalaya, jambalaya, and, and, and gumbo, and, and gumbo, and stuff like that. Love which I've it. heard is dig a good gumbo, incredibly good. I haven't been able to go there yet, but uh, but yeah, you and, instead of taking a left down to that side, you just take a right, and it's like right there. Um, okay. kind of a smaller place, but it, it's really cool. What do they so, uh specialize in? Uh, any spirit in particular? Whiskey. Okay, whiskey. Well, what, what yeah. kind of whiskey? So, We're talking bourbon, talking rye, we talking. Scotch. What, what They've got a couple of different ones, and both them and Iron Street also have like gin as well. Um, and I believe they have a couple of other ones. But, um, so I did buy a couple of bottles. They had a special where it was like buy one bottle, get a second bottle for a dollar. So nice. I, I, I did that. Um, and then I like I they rang it up, and I was like that that can't be right. Um, and they were like, nope, that's the special. I was like, oh, okay. So if I go back and I buy more, can, can I buy, you know, bring this up? That's good. I'll sign. I'll just buy more in there. And they said, no, because apparently it's Minnesota state law that you can only purchase 750 mils per day from a distillery. And I found that incredibly interesting. So, yeah, they were like, uh, we'd love to sell you more, but we can't come by tomorrow <laughs> which i was like mm, interesting hmm. so like from a dis- actual distillery yeah there's they cap you at a certain size because i think i bought like a, it was like a 375 well, so what they was the, like what was the second one for a dollar yeah. then it was two 375s is what i bought <laughs> okay so that you can uh, a total of 750 correct yeah that sounds like a minnesota <laughs> doesn't it doesn't it sound like the weirdest thing but you can go nice. you know three blocks away to the liquor store and just ransack it and that's fine that's so, yeah, makes sense i don't know so i, I guess they don't want to put the local your local city-owned liquor stores out of business or something along those lines i don't know anyway i had some obink whiskey and it was 
it was all right tasting, um, not good on the nose. So definitely, definitely with a mixer. Like, and Iron Street as well is a little bit funky on the nose too. So, I mean, you're, and maybe it's not fair because like I, I tried, especially I tried like the Iron Street right after I had like the old Forester 1910. So I think there's a little bit of gap in between those two. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, good to know. I, I've got so. some some new potential uh, sponsors, you know, to uh-huh. to hit up uh, if if I ever uh, get motivated to find some oh. new sponsors. It's ah, been a while, there you go. but yep. uh, on the uh, just you know, as long as their pitch about being on the nose reminds you of the banks of St. Cloud State University or something like that, so. You might have something there uh, like that. <laughs> it's got the smell. It's it. The smell reminds you of the, the days of the old Sartell paper mill. Like it's got that, those, the, the wafty you reminisce, reminisce about the smells of the press with iron straight <laughs> distillery. press on a Saturday night at 2 AM. Oh, wow. Nobody wants that. Bottle so. it up. It's a new Bottle perfume. Up. Yep, exactly. Uh, that about does her. Uh, this episode. Her. Uh, you can reach me at uh, uh, or on X at more clappers. M O A R more clappers. Andrew, where can they find you? At Andrew at greenground dot com, oh, as well right. as email. I still do email. Uh, Huskies hockey podcast at gmail dot com. Send me an email. I'll send you one back. Send me an email. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have any hot takes about 1970s movies and your yep. hot takes about the Godfather, let me uh, have those uh, Godfather three takes, Dan Jacobson. <laughs> there you go. Shoot them into my veins. Watch Godfather part three instead of watching uh, what Duluth against whoever they're playing in Milwaukee. He'll, he'll have it's... probably a better time doing that because <laughs> the, the Cole Spicerless Bulldogs <laughs> will not have any punch. No chance so, against Air Force. No. So, um, one other thing. Um, obviously, uh, thanks for everyone who um, listened to the last podcast. Um, also, when we had Jake Baskin on, great. Will Juniors. Um, great talk with him. Um, if you can, um, delete the download, re download it. Um, I kind of messed up on the audio track on it a little bit. Um, it should sync up a little bit better this time. But um, it was you know, uh, a great talk with him and, um, obviously USA four to one win against Norway. Um, and, uh, we'll, uh, you know, kind of keep an eye on that here over the next, uh, you know, a uh, week or so. We'll see hopefully USA takes home the goal. So let's hope uh, until next time, go Huskies. Woo.